order and welcome you to this, the 22nd meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2017. And I can remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent. The first item on our agenda is evidence on a continued petition. Petition 1627, Consent for Mental Health Treatment for People Under 18 Years of Age. Um, this petition was lodged by Annette McKenzie. Members will recall that we have previously reflected on the evidence received in relation to this petition. The evidence highlighted the importance of young people's right to confidentiality and therefore did not support any change in terms of young people being able to consent to their own treatment. However, in recognising the issues of confidentiality and consent, the committee agreed to invite oral evidence from charities within our expertise in youth mental health services to explore the wider support available to people under 18 years of age who experience and seek treatment for mental ill health. I'm grateful that we'll be able to explore some of these issues this morning with Graeme Henderson, Director of Service and Development at Penumbra, Carolyn Lockhead, Public Affairs Manager at um, Scottish Association for Mental Health, and Amy Woodhouse, Head of Policy, Projections and Participation in Children for Scotland. Um, and I think in order to make the most of our time this morning, I'm very grateful for you to be here. Uh, we will move straight to questions. I think the, what the committee felt very strongly was that in the evidence from the petitioner, there clearly was an issue here. And if it wasn't about the question of confidentiality and sharing of information, what was it we could do to keep our, our young people safe? And we hope that you may be, be able to help us in considering some of those issues. So perhaps if I can begin by asking what your views are in relation to support services currently in place to support young people with mental ill health. Me to start? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the um, opportunity to come and, 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 and talk to you this morning and, and to just first off recognise the, the sad reason why we're here and, and I think it's right that we're exploring this issue and what more could be done to prevent um, unnecessary deaths. Um, there are about um, one million children in Scotland and it's estimated that about 10% of them will have a diagnosable mental health problem. Uh, which equates to, if you can do the math, about 100,000 um, children. So this is not an insignificant amount. It's quite a large number of children and young people we're talking about. And that's with a diagnosable problem. So that's not just low mood stress with um, school or life. That's, that's diagnosable problems. Um, and if we look at the, the children, child and adolescent um, mental health service statistics that we have, we have some. Uh, we, have, we have statistics about staffing numbers and we have statistics about waiting times and they show a bit of a, a gap. So we have about a thousand um, staff in the CAMS workforce, so that's one to every um, thousand, um, uh, well, 10,000 uh, young people. Um, um, and CAM see roughly about uh, 4,000 referrals every quarter. So 4,000 is against 100,000. So we're really talking that the CAMS workforce has a very, very um, small role within the overall um, support provision for um, children and young people with mental health problems. So I guess what we need to talk about this morning is um, what is the response to that and is that the whole picture? I, given that we've got three representatives from the voluntary sector here this morning, we would say, no, that's not the whole picture and that statutory CAM services are only part of the story and part of the overall service provision for children and young people with mental health problems and that the voluntary sector have a huge role to play. Um, I'd probably like to acknowledge particularly um, the, the role of uh, youth work within this. Children in Scotland, um, as you may or may not be aware, are a, are a, a membership organisation from the children's sector. Um, and we've got about 500 members um, across Scotland and many of whom are providing support to these 100,000 children that we're talking about and many more um, beyond that. Um, and they are strapped for cash. Their services are short term, um, but they are providing an absolutely vital role as part of this picture of um, support, not just for those with mental health problems, but also in the prevention element of it, which is absolutely vital vital if we're going to address this problem of the mental health of our youth in Scotland today, because it is, it is significant. If I could follow that up, I'd absolutely agree with what um, Amy's saying. I think there are a couple of other points to be made about child and adolescent mental health services, or CAMS. 
Um, Amy's absolutely right in the, the statistics um, that she quotes. It's important to remember that we only really have targets and statistics for the upper levels of CAMS. So CAMS is intended to be a four-tier system where you start with universal services, so schools and GPs and health visitors, and move up to more specialist services. And we only really have data about referrals to tiers three and four, so the more kind of intensive um, sectors. Um, what we do know about those is that people are waiting longer than they should, so only about 80% of children and young people are seen within the 18-week target, a target that we feel is too long. And we know that about one in five um, young people are rejected from CAMS for one reason or another. Um, and we are grateful that the Scottish Government has recently asked us to look into that. We think there's a lot to look into and we hope to discover um, what's going on and, and make some recommendations that are going to, um, to really improve that situation. But I think Amy's quite right to say this can all be about um, clinical services, NHS services. One of the things that, that we are particularly keen to see is the provision of support within schools. Most children, not all, but most children are in schools already. That is where they are. To provide support in that place makes sense. We would like to see the provision of counselling for all secondary school aged children. We think that would go a long way to providing support, support where they are when they need it, rather than having to go through what can be quite a, a tricky, a complicated um, referral process. We know that there's about a quarter of a million um, children in Scotland who have no access to schools-based counselling. Um, we know there are 14 local authorities um, which have no on-site provision of school-based counselling, um, and, and only 40% of secondary schools have that provision. The Scottish Government is looking at that issue at the moment. We think it is an urgent one. Um, we know that elsewhere in the UK, there is a guarantee of um, schools-based counselling, so particularly in Wales, where they're, they're quite far advanced and there's good evidence coming out that it does make a difference. We don't think that Scotland should be any different. We don't think Scotland's children deserve any less, and we would really like to see some action on that. The, 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 the young woman in, in prompted the petition um, was actually out of school and was in work, but was under 18. I wonder if you have a view on how that council, that kind of model, which I understand, and I presume some of that could be delivered by pastoral care staff, but I wonder whether you think, is there a, how would that fit for young people who are you know, not in school but are under 18? I think you raise a really important point. So we know that CAMS um, across different NHS boards is defined differently. In some areas, it's provided up to age 18. Um, in some areas, that's only if you're in full-time education and otherwise it stops at age 16. And I think there is a problem with people kind of falling through those gaps. One of the things we want to see is CAMS to be extended up to age 25 if you're already in that system because we know that, that the transition can be very difficult and, to be honest, is not always well managed. And because we know we've heard from young people themselves um, via the Scottish Youth Parliament, which done some, has done some excellent work on this, that, that they feel that people, don't, people of that age they don't really fit into either child or, um, or adult services. What we really need in the longer term is a specialist service for that 16 to 25 um, age group to make sure that they don't keep falling through the gaps. Okay, thank you. Do you want, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, uh, just uh, um, I'm moving away a wee bit from CAMS into the <laughs> services that, that uh, the third sector can provide. Um, one of the things that Penumbra has been providing since 1994 is um, open access uh, youth services for, for mental health, including work in schools. Um, we, an example of which would be in Fife, we worked in all 19 secondary schools um, for a cost of about 200,000 a year, so about 20,000 a school, um, or sorry, 10,000 a school. Um, and that, in, uh, to give you an example of the kind of uh, issues that were been raised by young people, and this was S4, 5 and 6 typically, um, in one term, we had 120 young people expressing suicidal thoughts, and that's, that service was closed by the council um, because of uh, cuts, and um, that service was, is now been provided by another organisation, but on a much smaller scale. Um, we are, we're also currently doing work with primary three and four pupils around body confidence, because it's an issue that um, affects people at that age and, and uh, later and has a massive impact on their mental health and well-being. We also have a number of um, open access to youth, youth projects which were funded originally by the Choose Life programme which started around 2005. But I think as Amy said the cuts and pressures on uh, budgets from 
councils is, is having an impact on these services. Very much, Drona. Good morning. Um, I'd like to ask you specifically about prescribing drugs, mental health drugs, to under 18s. And with that regard, to what extent do you believe that GPs have all the necessary training to support people with mental health generally, and more specifically, to make appropriate prescribing decisions to ensure people around uh, the young people are informed of the possible side effects of the medications? How much confidence do you have that GPs are actually equipped enough to deal um, with young people and prescribing drugs? And that, um, I think there are two points to be made about that. I think you are right to highlight the role of GPs. We know that um, most people say they would go to their GP for help with their mental health, so they have an absolutely central role. We did some research with GPs a few years ago now where um, GPs did tell us that they, they wanted to know more about mental health. They didn't always feel like they had enough information. Um, indeed, there, there wasn't, I think just over half were aware of the, um, the sign guidance that exists on non-pharmaceutical approaches to depression, and we would like to see that awareness higher. So I think there is an issue in supporting and training GPs more um, in mental health issues, and indeed um, on the guidance around confidentiality and when they can break that confidentiality. One of the points that we made in, in our um, response was that, in, in fact, that there is the facility to break confidentiality at the moment where um, a young person is, is potentially in danger, and, and we're not sure that that is widely understood. I do feel there is another point to be made, though, about we want to see evidence-based um, treatment and support for children and young people. And in many cases, that can be a referral to a psychological service or to another service. But medication does have a role to play. And, and I worry sometimes about um, the impression that we give if we talk about medication for mental health in a way that is different than we talk about it for, for other areas. Um, it does have a role to play. Many people find it helpful in their support. And we should be careful not to stigmatise people um, who are prescribed medication. But that said, GPs, I think, do need more support and more training in mental health and in understanding the, the range of what's available. Can I just go back to what you said about confidentiality? Yeah. Um, so, uh, as I understand it, then, it's at the discretion of the individual GP about whether they would inform, say, for instance, parents or a close uh, family member. Um, and does that happen a lot, to your knowledge? Do, do, do you know whether GPs go down that road a lot? I have heard of it happening. I have never seen any figures that would indicate no what the scale of it see. is. No, uh -huh. not that I have seen. OK. Anyone else like to comment? Um, yes, yeah. please. Um, I think there's there's a couple of issues here. There's One is about confidence around talking about mental health. And certainly from my own previous experience at the Mental Health Foundation prior to my current post, working with the Royal College, it, that was an area that they'd identified themselves as lacking in, in a feeling that they lacked in training in within within their course. So I, th I think across the board, there's definitely a need for more of that and they would recognise that and support the opportunities for that. There's also the confidence about talking to children and young people. Um, and again, I think this is an area where there could be more that is done. I know in some practices, they will have um, specific GPs that, 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 that focus on that issue and that they'll be the, 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 the GP that, that um, young people are encouraged to make appointments with. There's also things they can do about private spaces and, and, and signposting information, which I think is really, really important. And the link worker role that exists within some GP practices, I know is primarily for, for adults, but I think there's probably a lot of scope to extend that model uh, for children and young people so that GPs know what options are available in their local areas so that more social prescribing approaches can happen. Um, and I, th I, th I think the other issue that, that again, um, the Royal College t talk about a lot is the amount of time that they have with patients and that really can you have detailed complex conversations about mental health within 10 minutes. No, you can't. You, and um, young people probably aren't aware of their rights to ask for a double appointment, for example. Um, so even 20 minutes, you're not going to be able to cover everything. But I think if young people were aware of that and knew what they were entitled to, that might be something that he could help as well. So it's also about how we talk to young people about what GP services are about and how you can, how your rights can be met and how you can get the most out of them. So there's, there's quite a lot mm -hmm. there in, in addition to what Caroline said as well. Yeah, I would like to say that uh, given that, that we all have mental health, it should be mandatory that GPs have mental health training. 
Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday at the biannual forum of the mental health strategy, uh, there were several um, from the Royal College of GPs and A&E consultants who mentioned the fact that they hadn't had mental health training since they did their university training. And these were people in their 50s, so a long time ago since they had the training. I think GPs are not aware of other options and struggling to come up with a solution might then revert to medication as the only answer. And it clearly isn't the only answer. There are other options for people. OK, thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you again. Good morning, panel. I think uh, just following on from um, my colleague uh, Rona Mackay's questioning, I just wonder if you could clarify what the current guidelines are in place for GPs to support young people presenting with mental he mental ill health, and one, are they fit for purpose, and two, do you think they're being adhered to in practice? I can maybe start on that. Um, there are so you, there's a mix of sign and nice guidelines that exist. Um, for, um, for, for medical staff in general. There is a specific sign guideline on non-pharmaceutical approaches to depression. That's not specific to children and young people. And there's nice guidance for children and young people that relate to depression and to social anxiety. Um, there aren't further nice guidelines or sign guidelines that relate specifically um, to mental health in children and young people. And that's possibly an area that we should look at. Um, I think you've had evidence from the GMC about their guidelines, which I'm, I'm less familiar with. Um, in terms of how much they are adhered to, I don't know that there's a lot of evidence um, about that. I certainly know that we hear from GPs um, that they would like to know more about mental health and about um, how to support children and young people in particular. Um, but I don't know that there's a lot of evidence about how strictly the guidelines are actually adhered to. Um, in addition to that, um, as a, as a child's rights organisation, we always advocate, ask children and young people what would help them and what would make um, services more accessible for them. And, um, and also in the spirit of, of things from the past that are still relevant today, I would point you towards the work of the Paul Hamlin Foundation. They had a five-year, £5 million programme a couple of years ago looking specifically at this issue about how um, GPs should be supporting young people aged 16 to 25. Um, and produced a series of, of guides for how practice could be improved and they're written um, from the perspectives of the young people themselves about what they felt would be helpful. Um, and they, 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 they cover um, having conversations about, so with, with regards to medication, that is um, knowing what the side effects are, knowing what the alternatives are, knowing what the benefits of it are. And it truly is, it's, I mean, it, 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 it backs up really what the, the GMC say in, in their, their guidance, but actually, um, I suppose, um, provides a bit of assurance that, that, that actually we're covering what children and young people need to make the informed decisions, because if this is all based on young people having capacity to make decisions about their care and treatment. and. We all have a duty to ensure that they are given all the information they need in forms that are clear and understandable to them so that they can make those decisions. So I think it goes beyond about the sort of the technical side of medications to actually how we have conversations with children and young people about what they mean for them in their lives. Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier some of the services that we provide. One of the services we worked with in Glasgow was uh, a peer mentoring service for um, three, four, uh, S3, 4, 5 and 6. Um, it, this was a project that trained S5 and S6 pupils to be peer mentors to S3 and 4 uh, because what pupils and young people tell us is that they, would, they get a lot of information from their peers mm -hmm. um, and therefore when they get whatever the issue might be um, they'll talk to their peers before they talk to anyone else and that's why you know peer mentoring and supporting young people to become peers would be a helpful way forward. Um, uh, GPs, as we all know, have little time uh, to talk to people. And as I think, as uh, Amy said previously, uh, even a 20 minute session would, would, wouldn't be an adequate uh, time to talk through some uh, mental health issues. Uh, can I just ask a, a supplementary to that? I, was, I just wondered what your view was uh, of the link work worker programme and to what extent are general practices in Scotland uh, currently participating in that programme? Yeah, well, well Pramod has just, uh, has just uh, started a, a link worker 
project up in uh, Murray. Um, six workers across 13 GP practices. Um, it's, it's been going for about a year and the evidence that com is coming back from that is that uh, the bulk of the issues that are being referred to link workers from GPs uh, relate to social issues, mainly around uh, housing, poverty, family relationships. Um, mental health is probably about 20% of the, the, the referrals that are coming through. Um, we also have a, a wellbeing centre in Murray, which then takes referrals from the link workers, um, as, as well as having a, a walk-in facility. So, and that way, I know there are other uh, link worker programmes around the country, but the, uh, this is the one that we have in Murray. We um, also provide link work services, particularly in North Lanarkshire, um, and we were very involved with the. Um, the initial pilot that was led by the Alliance and the Deep End GPs, which you're probably aware of. Um, we think there's a lot of benefit in the model, um, not least because it does begin to address some of the issues that Amy raised about the time available with GPs, but also because the job of the link worker is to really be embedded in the local community and have that sense of what is available locally, what are the strengths and the assets that, um, that people can um, can, can benefit for, from and, and mental health I think does tend to be one of the, the big issues that's that's raised um, in the broadest sense so it can be it can be a specific mental health problem but it can be an issue like bereavement it can be related to debt it can be related to employment so it's it, it offers the opportunity to really explore issues and look for what is actually going to help the person at this time and to allow them to lead that conversation so it's very much about identifying their goals and helping them to um, to link into what's what's available, um, we certainly see more and more GPs um, starting to engage with that, and indeed more IGBs beginning to commission these models. Um, and I, I do think it's something that has a lot of potential. And um, just making sure that people actually can get access to the services that exist. Yeah, I, I don't really have much to add to that, um, apart from the point that you need the services to exist in order for the link model approach to work. So that does require um, a strong um, community sector um, that's there to provide support to young people or adults um, where, they, where they live. Um, there is also, there are models which um, uh, I know um, involve um, a sort of self-help self support approach as well. So that's life coaching and, and um, um, a little bit more of the sort of talking therapy aspect to it as well so there are slightly different models and there might be scope to explore that more too for for young people um but i think um it certainly adds um considerably to what the G the, the practice can can offer um when they know what's available within their local communities and and actually just actually the, the time that takes to find that out is not really readily available mm -hmm. at the moment so it, it, it's really i i know invaluable where it does exist Good morning. Um, just before I start, I think I probably need to declare an interest that I manage services that provide mental health up to Tier 3, 4. Um, the, uh, as you're aware, it's been widely reported that there's been a significant increase in the rate of antidepressants described to under-18s in the recent years. And the Scottish Government's explanation for this is that the number of young people seeking help has gone up. First of all, do you agree with that explanation um, or do you think there are other factors um, such as access to other therapies that should be considered? I think we have absolutely seen an increase over the years of young people seeking help for, um, for mental health. We've, we've got figures that demonstrate that, that the rate um, is going up. Um, there is some evidence that the rate of emotional um, issues in young people is going up and that particularly in young girls, um, they're, incre they're experiencing increasing emotional issues. The issue of trying to unpick how much of that is due to the fact that we are more open as a society about mental health um, and how much of that is due to a genuine incidence, uh, increase in incidence is a, is a difficult one and I won't pretend I have the answers. I think certainly what, what we want to make sure is that when young people do take the very, often very difficult step and quite brave step of seeking help that they get a good response and the correct response and an evidence-based response and that is about the issues that we've discussed already about making sure GPs and others that they speak to have the confidence and the awareness and the tools at their disposal to make a good decision about where to refer them or what to prescribe them if that's appropriate. I think an issue um, that we haven't touched on yet so far is about the confidence of people 
around children and young people and actually having conversations about mental health. We recently um, surveyed staff working in schools um, and got over 3,000 responses. And um, we heard from about two thirds of, of teachers particularly that they didn't feel they had enough training in mental health to allow them to do their job properly. So we worry about that. We worry about the level of confidence and knowledge of mental health around children and young people generally, um, as well as making sure that the actual services are there. Certainly we see that um, if we look at the CAM stats, we see that um, there are more people waiting at the end of the quarter to, be, um, to start treatment in CAMS than actually do start treatment during that, um, that quarter. So that suggests that demand is outstripping the, um, the services that are currently available. Um, I absolutely agree with Carolyn's point about concerns about um, teenage girls. Um, we know from the Health Behaviour School Age Children's Study that's longitudinal evidence that something happens when girls in Scotland hit their teenage years and that their mental health deteriorates quite significantly. And we don't fully understand why, if that's to do with increased pressures in society, social media has given a lot of responsibility for this and I'm sure it does play its role. Schools clearly have a factor to play and we know relationships across the board are really important. So relation, having that trusted relationship in your life seems to be a really important protective factor. So it doesn't surprise me, those statistics. I suppose that doesn't mean that they're, they're right, though. And clearly, we know that what is, it's not easy to know what the correct um, rate of prescribing for antidepressants should be. I remember when there used to be a heat target for reducing antidepressant prescribing, um, and that was felt to be a good thing, but we didn't really know what the right rate should be, and I guess that's the same for children and young people, in recognition that probably it is the right thing for some children and young people. But is that be are we doing enough to prevent that from happening? And, and I think really the key to this is, is if it gets to the stage where a young person is prescribing needing a prescription of depression, um, antidepressants, we've left it too late. And really what we need to be focusing on is what can we do to stop their mental health getting to that point? Um, and that's not easy, but I, I do think um, we have a role to play. I know the early years is very, very important in terms of um, building resilience and um, good attachments. Or, you know, we, we, we know this now, we have evidence about this now. So, you know, if you were going to follow what we should we be doing, put more into the early years, put more into parental support um, would make a difference um, um, and, and, and I think as children get older mental health awareness so that they understand about their own mental health is absolutely key as well and they know the things that are likely to make their, their, their moods deteriorate and they know the things that are also help, helpful in terms of boosting them and keeping them well but that one trusted adult is absolutely vital and we know that that, that that can absolutely be the protective factor that makes all the difference so how do we as a society ensure that they that, that we can have that yeah it's working now um, thinking about the, um, the the rise in, in mental health problems being uh, disclosed by young people. I actually think it a wee bit differently about what people disclose and quite often they don't disclose mental health problems but they do disclose distress of some kind um, and one of the things we were discussing yesterday at the Mental Health Biannual Forum was the, um, the people who present to whether it's GPs or A&E um, and the exposed uh, or disclosed distress or unhappiness or whatever it might be, but they don't get to the point of having a diagnosed mental health problem. Therefore, they don't enter the mental health system. Uh, but they often can be then uh, unable to access other services. So they, they go away without a solution to whatever their distress is. And I think it's important that the distress brief intervention pilots that are running gather that information in relation to mental health, um, not just in relation to the general distress. I have asked a supplementary. <clears throat> um, I looked very hard at what the GMC had said and, and what the other um, contributors to, to our inquiries had said, uh, and two things came out for me. One is the statement by the GMC that they should only prescribe medicines if they have adequate knowledge of the patient's health and are satisfied <coughs> that they serve the patient's needs. Now, I suppose that my question to you then is, 
what would you say was the amount of time you needed to spend with a young person before you could make that adequate decision? And the second one was they stated very clearly in the letter um, that doctors should disclose information if this is necessary to protect the young person from risk of death or serious harm, which we would all recognise as safeguarding procedures that are mandatory training for most third sector organisations um, that has to be regularly updated. Um, what I didn't get out of this is whether GPs are required to undertake that mandatory training on a regular basis, um, and if so, whether the information sharing regulations that most of us are bound by and that we recognise and that we explain to a young person are regularly undertaken. And I wondered what your understanding of those two things were and your response to the GMC's comments. In terms of the time, that's really difficult to say, and I suppose mm. it's how well the GP already knows the young person. So if we look at back at the golden era where everybody knew their family practitioner and you'd had that relationship with them, then, you know, potentially, although there are issues about that as well, and that if you know them too well and you know their family, are you feeling able to, to, to be, you know, talk about mental health or something that's potentially mm. stigmatising? Um, but yes, I mean, I think I think the point is that ten minutes isn't probably going to going to do it, is it? For something that's as sensitive as that. Um, in my in my previous show, I did a lot of work around long term conditions and, and mental health, and um, talking to people with 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 it, it, multiple um, issues that they used to go to the GP practice with. The mental health one was always the one that was left till the last. So that was as they were almost as they were leaving the door. Oh, and another thing, doctor, um, and I and it's because it's not easy to talk about. It's not easy to talk that you're struggling, that you're having difficulties with a stranger and with somebody that's in a professional role that has more power than you. Um, so um, I don't know what the answer is other than more time, other than the doctors that are, are um, make efforts within their practices to become inclusive and welcoming for children and young people so they feel like safe spaces, perhaps having other professionals like um, nurses or link workers or hey youth workers based within practices that can have those conversations so the clinics some some have young adolescent clinics that they can have drop-ins and talk about sexual health and other issues and, and extending that to ensure that they're available for mental health I think would be helpful in terms of the duty to share information um um, I, I don't know about the, the technicalities of practice within within um, within Scotland, so I'd probably be overstepping my mark by going in, into that. But we do have very good um, suicide uh, intervention training in Scotland through Assist and, and, and Storm, and, and there was great pressures to ensure that a high proportions of the workforce in general were trained in that, and and, and it would be very interesting to see um, the proportion of primary care um, staff and GPs in particular that had had specific training on these standardised packages that we have in Scotland. Um, I'm sure there would be ways of finding that out, um, but I don't know myself. So we mentioned that yesterday about the training packages, including the mental health first aid training, assist, storm. And there was originally a target, the Scottish Government target of 50% of frontline staff. Uh, and it would appear that that 50% target was reached and it achieved 52%, I think. And that now the target is gone. Actually, we need the target to be 100% um, because... The target is stopped having a target. The tar there is no target now, so the target was achieved. It would appear that that, would be, that box had been ticked. Um, and there, what, my, my view would be that 100% of frontline practitioners should have these training at uh, assist and mental health first aid, STORM. Well, that's maybe something we can pursue. Um, Angus? OK, thanks, um, convener, and good morning uh, to, to the panel. Um, I think it was Carolyn Lockhead who, who mentioned the Scottish Youth Parliament earlier, um, and we, we know that uh, its members favour an increased focus on social prescribing opportunities, uh, either as an alternative to or to complement uh, medical interventions, such as peer-to-peer -peer support, which has already been mentioned by Graeme Henderson, uh, also talking to youth workers, uh, information centres and uh, counselling. 
Um, so I, I wonder if you could expand on the views that you've already articulated this morning of the of these alternatives, and are you are you aware of any good practice that currently exists that hasn't already been mentioned this morning? I think um, the Youth Parliament has done some excellent work on mental health in recent years. Um, their report, um, Our Generation's Epidemic, was one of the, the factors that really pushed Sam H towards um, campaigning specifically on children and young people's mental health. Um, I think they've done a, a great job of highlighting both the problems and potential solutions. We absolutely agree that social prescribing and links work and peer support and, and all of the issues, um, the, the approaches that you've mentioned, um, should be more available, should be developed, um, so that they are available to people when they are the best option. Um, I am a little wary of, of presenting those as um, alternatives to medication, as if medication is always a bad thing. I, I think there is an evidence base, as we've said, for medication, and people should be given the right treatment and should not be made to feel stigmatised for it. But there is absolutely a wide range of, of approaches that should be more available. Um, particularly, we've mentioned already the need for counselling to be available in schools. Um, there are some good examples of peer work going on where young people can support each other and I think that as long as those young people that are doing the supporting are themselves properly supported and trained, um, that, can, uh, that can also be really helpful. So absolutely support the, um, the, the suggestions that the Youth Parliament has made. Um, again, I would probably say it, it's worth asking young people themselves about what's helped them. Um, and I will um, throw in um, digital spaces here because um, we do need to recognise that that's where uh, young people um, get a lot of um, peer support is online. Um, and we need to be aware of that. And we need to be aware. I think we talk a lot about the risks associated with um, social media. Um, but there are also great opportunities if you are living in a remote part of Scotland um, on a croft and don't have the opportunity to go to a youth centre in your local community. Online space is invaluable for connecting you with others that have um, um, had similar experiences to you and um, getting that peer support, which is absolutely vital. Um, I think we have a responsibility to be to to tool ourselves up with the knowledge about the places that young people are going to do that, um, so that we can support them and encourage them to the ones that are good and that are supportive, and that we steer them away from the ones that are very risky and damaging. And certainly in the area of self harm and suicide prevention, there are ones that are risky and damaging. Um, but this is an important, you know, most young people live their lives equally online and offline in a very seamless manner. Um, and I certainly think, particularly, um, probably us all, but um, um, certainly in mental health professionals and public sector in general, aren't necessarily um, fully equipped and understanding of how they use those spaces. Um, um, and I suppose social prescribing should be aware of, of that as well and see that as an option that's available too. Certainly as a great resource if it can be life-saving. I know it saved people's lives, I do know that. Yeah, um, give an example from uh, our Fife service where we had a, a closed managed Facebook group that the young people um, themselves requested. So they then supported each other through this closed, managed uh, Facebook group. It was managed by Penumbra, the Penumbra workers, to make sure there was no um, inappropriate behaviour on, on the Facebook group. But that was what was requested by the young people. Um, and another um, initiative that we're involved in, I mentioned earlier, is the work with young school children, primary three and four, around the body confidence. And that's a huge issue for young people. Um, and a lot of that information and pressure comes from social media. So there's a need to educate people and also to focus on body confidence and not negative body images, which is the prevailing um, mm -hmm. approach in the, in the media, the general media. Yeah, thank you. I'm really pleased to hear you uh, praise the Scottish Youth Parliament on the work that they've done in this so far. Um, I, I did a question time in my constituency in a high school uh, a couple of weeks ago, and of the three questions, uh, this was the one that uh, uh, was of most concern to, to, to the, the high school pupils. Um, if I could uh, skip on, uh, perhaps, to, to the Scottish Government's 10-year uh, mental health strategy that, uh, that was introduced earlier. 
um, this year. Um, now, I believe, I mean, CAMS has already been mentioned uh, this morning. Uh, I believe part of that strategy was a £15 million increase in the budget for, for CAMS. Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely uh, sure of that. I don't have like, these, that figure in front of me, but I think it was £15 million. Um, I probably know the answer to this, but is that enough um, uh, to support, you know, uh, schools-based counselling services, as have already been mentioned? And are you surprised that schools-based counselling services aren't included already in the uh, health strategy, mental health strategy, as you mentioned earlier? Yeah, I could maybe start then. Um, there's a general lack of uh, resources identified in the strategy. There's a lack of uh, outcomes and targets identified in the strategy. And there's a specific issue around the lack of resources directed at children and young people. What we've seen in, this, in, the, in the last strategy and this one has been a focus on NHS and medical interventions. So there isn't a focus on non-NHS or, or non-medical interventions, upstream interventions, interventions with younger people, we wait until they're diagnosed with an illness and then we put in support. So actually, it's not adequate to put in 15 million, 100 million. I mean, uh, that none of these figures are adequate, actually, because they should be much more of the resource directed at children and young people. Of the, I think it's about a billion pounds we spend on mental health. I mean, there was a call yesterday from someone asking for 50 per cent of that money to be spent on children and young people. That, that, that's a good place to start, I suppose. So early intervention is yes. the key. We know that um, most mental health problems start in adolescent um, lessons, and um, if not treated early, will continue on into adult life and have hugely debilitating effects for the rest of many people's lives and, and be responsible for the, the health inequalities that people with mental health problems uh, experience and end up in them dying younger. Um, so there's an imperative not just because children and young people have a right to good mental health here and now, but also as a prevention for the extra costs into their adult life, both emotionally, socially and financially. Um, so yes, I mean, there, there, we could make a very strong case for, for a ha much higher proportion of the overall budget getting put to, um, towards um, children and young people. You're not going to get any complaints from us about that one, I don't think. Um, I suppose it's worth bearing in mind that there are other parts of the government that are partially funding mental health responses as well. So I mentioned youth work um, before, but the other one which is worth um, being aware of is, is um, the Pupil Equity Fund. So that is, fund, uh, um, is, is funding to address the poverty-related attainment gap um, and can be funded to undertake activities around literacy, numeracy or health and wellbeing. And a lot of schools are choosing to use their money to invest in school-based counselling, uh, mental health support, pupil support within the schools and are contributing part of the, the, the response to this, this issue. Um, whether that is right or wrong is... Is, is, is open for debate and it, it, it should who, whose responsibility should this be to fund this should it all lie within within the mental health um, units within government or should it be across the whole government and I think there is an argument to say that mental health is everybody's business so mental health is education's business mental health is community's business mental health probably is fisheries business in some way or another you know that that actually we should all be funding it across across all parts of government making a contribution and that might have a better chance in terms of actually reaching the total that we need to in, in terms of responding so one, one uh, caveat to amy's point about mental health being everyone's business it then becomes nobody's business one of the things we spoke about yesterday was doing a mental health impact assessment across all policy areas of Scottish Government. I mean, there's a, there's, uh, equalities assessments are routinely done, or environmental impact assessments are routinely done, but there aren't mental health impact assessments done. And that would ensure that every policy department and division of the government had a, had a view to what the impact would be in people's mental health and wellbeing. I think there's um, 
uh, some other points to be made about um, the, the, the issue of schools-based counselling, which you raised. Um, we know the strategy contains a commitment to review schools-based counselling, which is very welcome, I think, from our perspective. We know that um, children in, in Northern Ireland and in Wales already have a guaranteed right to that, and to a lesser extent uh, they do in England, and I think that to us seems fairly clear, that there's no reason at all Scotland's children shouldn't also have that right, so we would like to see that acted on very quickly. In terms of the budget, um, we've previously called for the CAMS budget to be doubled. I think the, the point that's been raised about would that be enough? Uh, uh, no, um, but it would be a good start. I do think, I mean, there are good actions in the, the, um, the mental health strategy relating to, um, to children and young people's mental health, but, but I do think it is worth looking at. We, we saw just this week a Green Paper um, published at Westminster level about children and young people's mental health, um, which builds on the existing um, £1.4 of additional money that's been made available for children and young people's mental health, um, commits to recruiting 1,700 more therapists and, and, and supervisors. Um, and, and to ensuring that an additional 70,000 children and young people will, um, will obtain support from mental health services. Now, some of that's been rolled out quite slowly. It's only been rolled out in areas of the country, so I wouldn't want to, to overemphasise um, what's happening there. But I, I do think it is worth looking at what's happening in other areas of the country and asking ourselves, are we doing enough? You know, can we be learning from, from other areas? Is there more that we can do? Brian Thank you, Community. Yeah. Going back to this specific petition, uh, the, the question that has been in my mind since uh, hearing that evidence is when a person's mental health deteriorates to a point where, where uh, a, a medica medication is required, isn't there a question around then the competence of that person to manage their own medication? So is that an issue about capacity that you? Well, yeah, I think what, what my, my point is that uh, you know this was obviously a, a, mm -hmm. a, a tragic case at, mm -hmm. at an extreme. Um, but if, 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 if medication is, is required, uh, you know we're, we're then passing on that competence, that ability uh, of the, the patient themselves to manage their own medication. Mm -hmm. And if, the, if, the, if their mental health is deteriorated to a point when they need men, uh, medication, you know from a GP's perspective. Should that should they be should yeah. they be passing that competence along? Um, I suppose. It I, I guess I have, I, as, 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 a, as a children's organisation, probably have, have, have to think about this in terms of a, of a child's rights perspective. And, and I think there's several rights here which are relevant. There's obviously, as, as, as we've mentioned earlier, the right to have a say about matters that affect you in your life and the fundamental importance of, um, of, of, of children and young people as individual citizens in and of their own right and if they have the ability to make decisions that they should be particularly at the age of 16 mm -hmm. able to do that when they have the you know the decision to you know many other decisions to vote to get married etc etc so decisions about their care in principle um are absolutely fundamentally important as well um I suppose the, the one of the other articles which is very um relevant here is um Adults should do what is best for you, and that is Article um, Three. And are we doing enough to ensure? And I've, this is a point that I've said earlier that young people who are vulnerable because of their mental health, I absolutely recognise that, and are being um, given all the support that they need to enable them to make those decisions. So there may be a role for advocacy here, so that they have some adult who may be one step removed from the, the, um, the, the, the mental health practitioner or the GP who can talk through those options with them and come up with a plan with them. So it's not just their decision by themselves, because I recognise it could be a difficult decision, particularly when you're being offered medication or nothing. Um, that's Hobson's choice in many respects for some young people when they're considering the side effects that might be associated with that and that they, you know. So... Um, I, I would be very, very reluctant to talk about this. And be, the implications potentially of what you're saying is, is if you have a mental health problem, you don't have the capacity to make decisions about your care. And I fundamentally disagree with that. But um, everybody with mental health problems deserves the support from some professionals to help them make those decisions um, and, and work through that in a, in a very rights-based way so that they're, they're, they're entitled to make those choices and have choices that are going to help them with their care and treatment. I suppose the point that has been made 
by the petitioner was that if she had known that her daughter had the tablets prescribed to her, even if she didn't agree or was concerned about the fact that she was taking the tablets, A, she would have known to look for the side effects and to understand them rather than to you know, not understand them. And also she would have managed her medication. She would have supported to manage her medication. So it wasn't you know, some hostile person denying a young person their rights, but actually with more information could have provided the support that clearly wasn't available in the system mm -hmm. to her. Because what was available in the system to her was medicine. Yeah. And, I mean, and, and I wonder whether, linked to that, if you haven't got that guarantee, if there isn't some supportive person mm -hmm. that can help manage your medication, should there be limits on how many tablets you're prescribed at a time? I think, um, sorry, Amy, if I, can, yeah, yeah, um, no if I can come in on that, I think I would be extremely concerned if we were to go down the road of, road of assuming that a young person with a mental health problem lacks capacity. No, I um, didn't say, with respect, I didn't say that. I understand I think, that, I think, I'm responding it's, to it's, Mr Pittle's it, question. Well, I think it's, it's, it's not that they lack capacity, that they're in a position of distress, anxiety, that, that's brought them to that position, when we will all have known people who've been in those circumstances. And, you know, so if I break my leg and I'm distressed by it, I don't expect somebody just to say, well, go on with it. There would be supports that you would put in place that wouldn't be um, medical provision, but it would be an understanding that you need support because they've been shocked or whatever. And I think there's that that question of how fun somebody feels when they finally get to the point where they get to adopt should be recognised. I mean, I'm assuming it is recognised. I've spoken to GPs. I know it's recognised. It's not just simply a question of handing them over the tablets and saying, I have confidence you can deal with that yourself. I just wonder whether there's an issue here about GP practice under phenomenal pressure. And yes, they can prescribe because that, they're allowed to do that. They haven't got time to do the things that would... Which, whether there should be in place a hierarchy of interventions by the GP before they get to the point of prescribing tablets. Absolutely, and the point I was about to go on to make was about points we have made before about the importance of reviewing prescriptions when they are made to make sure that people aren't um, given a prescription and then left for a long time, that they should be reviewed quickly and indeed that they shouldn't be made un unless they are in line with evidence-based guidelines. I think there was a point in the earlier question suggesting that if a young person has got to the point of being prescribed mental health medication, is there a question about their ability to manage their medication? And that's the point I was responding to. Um, I would have great concerns about um, making an, a blanket assumption that, th that those young people would not have the capacity to manage their own medication. I do think what is really important is that GPs are aware of the guidance on whether they should prescribe and how much they should prescribe and at what point they ought to be breaching confidentiality. And when I read the evidence from the petitioner, those were the questions that were going through my mind. Um, I think there is a point about we mentioned earlier the excellent work of the Youth Parliament and in their evidence they expressed concern about young people, if they didn't feel their confidentiality was going to be respected, would they come forward for help at all? I think that is a genuine point and I think we also have to recognise that not everybody has supportive parents who want to or who will understand the issues. Not everybody has supportive parents who will help them to manage medication if they were put in that position. I think we need to look at every case um, individually, but we do also need to make sure that the, the guidance we already have for GPs and other professionals on how these cases should be managed is well known and is followed. I wasn't suggesting for one second that there should be a blanket, uh, a blanket sort of, uh, sort of policy here of, of not recognising, of, of saying there's no capacity there, but surely that that, that that question has to be in a GP's head when handing over medication around their ability to manage their medication. Can I take the board a question and then we yeah, can... Well, I was just really on the, the same subject, just to follow up on what, what's been said. I think this goes back to a much earlier question about GPs' training and competency in this whole issue and the fact that there doesn't seem to be a kind of standard framework for them because it's not like... Um, you know, prescribing somebody a course of antibiotics and saying, well, if you don't feel better, come back. And they surely must know that, that if, if a young person's at the point where they have to go and receive medication, it's, it has to be followed through. And they can't just be given a load of um, uh, tablets which um, they have to deal with. Um, and and the, surely in the GP's mind that, the, that that must not be the correct way. And I just wondered what your views on that was as far as... Uh, from a professional um, capacity, you know, of a doctor handing out tablets to um, clearly someone with um, the mental health issues. Absolutely. In, in the evidence that we originally submitted to the committee, we reviewed some of the guidance um, that does exist for GPs 
Um, and uh, obviously, um, I'm very wary of talking about an individual case where I don't have all the facts. Yeah. But I do think it's really important to ask where are the guidelines followed, both in terms of considering whether to involve parents, whether to, to breach that confidentiality, which um, doctors can do. They, they do have that, that right, and indeed, I would say duty. Um, whether the guidelines were followed in terms of what to prescribe and how much to prescribe. These are really important guidelines, um, and they should be well understood, and they should be followed. Um, and I am not sure that they always are. An additional question that I think would be useful for, for um, doctors to ask young people in this case is, do you have an adult you trust in your life that you can tell about this so far as has as been recognized you know not all you know what, what do we do with looked after children you know um what do we do with young carers who's you know are, are taking on that caring role within their or you know what do we do with with children that don't have a positive relationship with their parents is there somebody else that is in your life do you have a an auntie or a, or a granny or is there a t is there is there some adult that will you you can you know can support you through this i think i i'm Will you tell, you know, can, can I tell them about it? Do you, we can talk, we can share information if we have young people's consent. Are they asking that question would be the first place to start. Are they always, I don't know if they are. But yeah. Okay. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think what we're actually dealing with here is um, the differential between going in for a mental health consultation which in general terms, you know, with a young person, you'd probably allow an hour to, to talk to a young person and a 10 minute GP appointment. Um, I don't see it in my papers here, but I'm sure I read in previous papers for this petition that the, uh, the petitioner's daughter actually refused or, or declined psychological support at the time. Am I correct in saying that? Does anybody recall? And yeah. Choose the question, I suppose, is whether you immediately then go to... I, mean, I don't yeah. think we want to second-guess no, what was no, decided no, but, but within an individual consultation, but there is a, I think the question we're asking is how does that, how does that build through? Yeah. You know, because perhaps it, you know, in some circumstances people repel, repel all borders yeah. in the first stage but then can be persuaded or, or yeah. encouraged. My, I suppose my, my point here is, is the NICE guidelines are very clear about the prescription of, of medicines in, in the case of particularly around antidepressant medication, around the, the process that GPs or others should take. Um, and it certainly indicates that they should be seen within a week um, of, of prescription, that they should be encouraged to do other things. Um, and I suppose this comes back round to this whole business of training and updating, um, because we do seem to have a gap here in terms of the treatment of young people. I wholly support their right to confidentially, and I wholly support the fact that actually young people should have the right to make decisions and they should feel able to, to attend without feeling that whatever they say is going to be passed on to all and sundry. Um, but the safeguarding requirements should be paramount in terms of information sharing. Um, and the particularly things like the NICE guidelines, you know, are there for a very specific reason as a result of the evidence base that has been looked at. Um, and I wondered from, from your perspective, whether you think that in terms of the way we treat guidelines with young people in the way that we are making decisions and strategies, whether you think there is adequate adherence to the evidence base that is out there for young people, and whether actually, in, in particularly in terms of mental health, when young people actually go and ask for help, whether we need a much more robust response. This is a little bit more than just a guideline. Um, that may or may not have been read recently or, or thought about recently, um, you know, whether we need something much more robust, because we certainly have a huge increase in the number of young people who are seeking that kind of help. And as I think Amy indicated earlier, we don't entirely understand why, um, but we are perhaps responding adequately to some of this. And I just wondered what your thoughts on what you think should be done around this. Adequate adherence to evidence base and guidelines. I mean, I guess the GMC would be the best place to find out that information in terms of complaints that have been um, brought forward and, 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 and general practice. I don't have that information myself that I can 
illuminate on um in terms of the uh, more robust response yes it would wholeheartedly agree that that, that we, we we need to do more um in terms of ensuring that support is available across the whole of the the tiers is the tiered model you know um approach which is which is which has been around for quite a long time so that you have the low level um prevention work than the awareness raising work which we've talked about within schools and community settings and then um clearly your own you know you're familiar with this one the neuron service then that ramps up or down as required and the needs of the children and young people are required and so i think probably um where we are at the moment is we have specialist services which are very small and overstretched and with cams and we have some awareness raising happening at the lower level but very little in the middle um, and I would think that that is um, um, a real gap and, and, and should be the focus and is one which quite often primary care fills um, but doesn't seem to be much of an offer in terms of other than medication for children and young people within primary care at the moment. Um, the, I should mention that Audit Scotland are, are currently doing an audit of ch children and adolescent mental health services, which is due to report September time, I think, um, and that will be invaluable evidence. Once we have, it's a, it's a challenge, but they are looking across that whole tiered approach. I don't know the extent to which they'll get into the, 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 the community-based stuff, but um, that will give us a picture of what mental health services for children and young people look like in Scotland that we don't really currently have. And I think that will show the, where the gaps are as well and we'll be able to use that, I think, to advocate for change. So I would, um, I would look out for that when it comes, if you're not already aware of it. I think on the point about the guidelines, I think it is a frustration that we already have um, good... Um, well-written evidence-based guidelines that aren't always um, adhered to and that don't always have good awareness and like Amy says I think the GMC would be the place to look for for factual information on, on awareness and adherence um, and I think there is a question for I suppose it's the GMC and the Royal Colleges about how we increase that awareness um, and, and make sure that people are working to it. Um, I think absolutely there is an issue about not just the guidelines but also the support that is available so when you recognise that a young person is in need of some kind of help, do you know what is available? Is there enough available? Certainly one of the things that um, I would hope to look at um, in the coming months as part of the, um, the audit that I mentioned earlier is about the threshold and the criteria for CAMS, in terms of what, which varies across the country, in terms of what a particular CAM service provides, which, which can be different in different areas, and what threshold do you have to meet to qualify for it? In some areas, it, it sounds to me as if you have to be really quite unwell to get access to CAMS and, and is that the right approach and, and if it is then what else are we making available for those people who clearly do need some help but don't perhaps meet that, that rather steep um, threshold. Uh, and specifically in relation to the guidelines for GPs who um, dispense uh, or prescribe psychotropic medication, um, it may be possible to have a guideline that says you don't just prescribe medication, that there should be something else that's done, whether that's access to a supportive adult or to a, a nurse follow-up quicker than a month or to another service, a talking therapy. But that might be possible as, as a guideline. Um, in relation to the, you mentioned earlier, the safeguarding requirements. So as a service provider, all of our staff are required under contract to adhere to safeguarding rules. Um, I'm not sure if the same applies in other areas. I wonder if it's worth very briefly clarifying that the, the NICE guidance um, for children and young people on depression does say that they should be offered a psychological therapy in a, as well as an antidepressant. So that, again, there's a point about the awareness of guidance. OK, thanks very much. I, mean, I do think there's an issue around... I mean, my mother's generation were routinely offered antidepressants and the world has moved on and said there should be presumption against that and uh, you know, that idea that perhaps what we should be exploring further is the possibility to put further steps in I'm not saying you know there's nothing about the stigma around um, where people need uh, medication that they get it but the inappropriate use of medication is a historic fact that people didn't really address the questions round about mental health and simply said well I'll give you a tablet and you can deal with that.
and therefore there was a whole load of people um, getting tablets that perhaps it, it wasn't appropriate. And I have to say I was concerned, I'm not sure if it was for this petition or a later one, where the response from the Scottish Government to the, the increased prescribing of drugs was saying this was good because it meant that more people were coming forward. What it might mean is that under pressure GPs are prescribing to people who are coming forward with mental health issues. And I think that's maybe something um, we would want to explore. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll let other folk in um, how we take this forward because I think that's been really um, useful and explores a whole range of challenges for MD working with um, young people with mental health issues. Um, I've been told anecdotally that young people have to refer themselves to CAM. So what if they went and there was something physically wrong with them, they would be referred to a consultant, but they have to do it themselves. And I think it might be something we, we might want um, to explore. But this question about no target any longer in training is also something that perhaps is something I want to highlight. So in terms of taking this forward, I think we've already um, discussed the possibility of perhaps inviting the Minister for Mental Health in, but I think that would be something that we should agree to do. Yeah. Are there anything else? I mean, I think maybe we can check back on the official report and things that have come up that it might be worth our pursuing. We did get um, responses from the GMC and so on, but it might be something we want to just remind ourselves of ahead of any meeting with the, the Minister. To go back to the GMC to ask them about um, safeguard training, yeah, yes. to ask them about um, their adherence to guidelines. I mean, the, the, their response was very full, and it, it's quite clear within their own um, expectations all these things are there, but there's a difference between them, them being there and whether it's done, because I think there is an enormous amount of pressure on GPs at the moment, and most, most of them aren't paediatric specialists. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a it's a big piece of very specialist work that they probably have had minimal experience of. Um, and I would like to know what kind of requirements there are or what kind of um, percentages, if they've got that, of GPs are doing their safeguard training and their updating on mental health. I don't know health. that's perhaps more that the, the colleges would be aware of that. I'm not sure. I think there's a distinction between the GMC and, and the college. You might know more about it than me, but we, we maybe want to just to check where we would get that information from. Mm -hmm. Brian? I think... You know, almost following on from that, I think about one of the things I'm, I'd be interested to find out is is uh, the, the the access to CPD, and the, you know, and I think the and that and that is actually that's actually generally across the health board. Mm -hmm. it, 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 may, it, may, it might be available, but do they have the, the mm -hmm. time and capacity to access mm -hmm. uh, this kind of development? As we, as we said earlier on, you if you're 30, 40 years into being a, a GP. You know these services have moved on dramatically mm -hmm. in so that time. But obviously, you're not necessarily going to cover every subject, mm -hmm. and it's about what, what if any mandatory mm -hmm. CPD is there. And I think it's uh, also under yeah. you know the, the balance between um, GPs who are unaware of what the training mm -hmm. is and those who mm -hmm. are under such phenomenal pressure that they're simply managing a process mm -hmm. and are not really don't. I mean, I've met, I had the privilege of meeting with mm -hmm. one of. The GP practice in one area, and that was really the point they were making that that they're under the cost in terms of appointments, but they're not really necessarily got the time. And that whole thing with the link worker in in, in deep end uh, GP surgeries, which is but it's you no, know, it's it's only a small part of the provision, but it might be something that we can look at further. So can we agree then? We would invite in the Minister for Mental Health to explore. I think the, the issues that are highlighted in this petition, and recognising again that the um, you know, the petition itself comes from very difficult, tragic circumstances, and it may not be the solution, which is simply around the issue of confidentiality. But I think it highlights a number of other issues we would want to look at so that we can um, protect the young people and keep them safe. It's, it's, it's an issue for health and social care partnerships as well, to maybe in their local area, you know, issue guidelines or, or, or more than that. Um, that you know, if a young person goes and, and is prescribed, then it is it's a requirement that they they are you know signposted locally to some counselling. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I don't know if that's within the maybe within something the that in, in asking the minister to come in, we should ask what yeah. they see as the role for the uh -huh. local health and and mm -hmm. social care partnerships. I think it, it, it does all come back. To, to safeguarding because information sharing, which has been a huge element of discussion over the last few years, and the underpinning of the safeguarding guidelines which are produced by every local government area, NHS area, is that 
that question about when do you share information and you share information when you have reason to believe that the young person's life may be in danger um, or that they may be endangering somebody else mm -hmm. and, and it is that decision making that is crucial because independent and confidential um, access and the right to that independent confidential access is, is, is paramount but the safeguarding procedure overlays that and that's the point at which you decide whether or not you need to tell somebody about what's going on with somebody. And, and in the petitioner's case, and in many of the cases that would, would relate to this, for me, that's, that's the yeah. crux of the problem. And I, th and I think it's important to remember it's, you know, it, it, it's 16 year olds we can be talking Safeguarding about. Safeguarding applies you know, to vulnerable adults yeah, as well. 16 and she, is so, very, very young. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it, would, it's also it would count it's either way. how visible um, it is to somebody. You know, it's not necessarily. I guess if somebody's in a total crisis, you could spot that. But if somebody's quite calm uh -huh. as they present themselves, they're suffering a bit from stress, somebody suggested, I feel anxious. But that's also about training, because yeah. assist training, you know, truly suicidal people are extremely calm. Um, they're not het up, you know. So, so that is about being able to spot and understand, okay. you know, what's going on. Mm. Okay. I think that there is, there is loads for us then to explore the Minister, Minister for Mental Health around this whole question of how um, we address the support for, for young people and ensure that they get the, the appropriate support and treatment if it's, it's deemed necessary. Can I thank our panel very much again for being here? I think we found that uh, very useful um, and obviously we look forward to the further consideration of this petition. And can I suspend the meeting briefly to allow witnesses to leave the table? Thank you. If I can call the meeting back to order again, um, we're moving on to the agenda item two, a new petition. Um, and petition 1674 on managing the cat population in Scotland was lodged by Ellie Stirling. The petition calls for a review of the Code of Practice under the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act 2011 to control the domestic cat population and protect the Scottish wildcat. 
We shall take evidence on the petition from Ellie Stirling. Can I welcome you to the committee? The committee members have a copy of your petition and a written submission that you provided to support the petition. You have the opportunity to make a brief opening statement of up to about five minutes, and after that, the committee will ask a few questions to help inform our consideration of the petition. So we can hand over to you. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to have this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Change of tack, except I did work all my paid life as a clinical psychologist in the mental health service in England and Scotland, so it was a very interesting discussion to hear. Um, having said that, I think it's relevant to the petition I'm bringing. I'm, I'm not paid to do the work I do now, but I work virtually full time, as you do when you retire, um, in environmental work. And for some reason, I seem to be attached to cats. And as I worked with very vulnerable people in vulnerable circumstances, I, I tended towards trying to help those cats living in vulnerable circumstances. So for the 20 years since I moved back to Scotland, I'd been doing Trap New to Return, which some of you may know is an approach that's um, used universally, but it's been used by the Scottish Wildcat Action to try to limit the number of um, cats of the domestic species that crossbreed with the wildcat. So I'd been doing that for the welfare of cats for about 20 years. Um, and to be honest, I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised, but found it's really quite a war zone out there. There are animals living in circumstances that you wouldn't dream of for your own pet at home. Now, you may not have pets, um, but those of you who do know that people who keep pets, dogs, cats, rabbits, whatever, do tend to see them as a vulnerable and um, important member of the family. Vulnerable in the sense that we, we have a responsibility to keep them safe and meet their needs, as we do our children. And that's not happening for the cats out there. So that a lot of people think that feral cats are different species from our cats at home. They're not. They're exactly the same cats. They just are uncared for. So um, I'd been doing that for a few years, uh, maybe 10 years before I noticed the areas where I'd neutered all the cats started to fill up with cats again. And those turned out to be cats that were coming from the pet cat population. So a bit late in the day, I did some research and found some studies, which you've got references to in your papers. And they were telling me that there's a minority of pet cat owners who still don't neuter their cats. Um, pet organisations have made great headway say there's 90% of owners neuter their cats now, but 10%, 13% in Scotland don't, you'd think, that's fine, we'll just keep nudging and nudging, and we'll get there. But it's not happening. Uh, I looked at more figures, and it showed that the number of homes available for cats had stalled in 2013, and it's not getting any higher, and if anything, it's going down. So the point that 10% of the cat owners are producing enough new animals to increase the pet cat population over two times every four years. It, it's simple arithmetic, isn't it? Where are these cats going? They're overspilling. There's not enough homes for them. Um, we can talk about the figures later if you like, but they're overspilling into back streets, countryside. And of course, by this time, I'd um, shoveled alongside the Scottish Wildcat Project and was helping them as best I could with TNR techniques. And discovered the, the crucial importance for controlling our domestic cat stray and feral population for us to save the wild cat in Scotland. So the research I did, and it's only to my shame I did it this year, um, has brought me to this point today. And it seems to me that we're at a tipping point and a decision point if we go on the way we are and cats are still produced and join the already enormous and growing feral and stray population, it would seem the wild cat doesn't have a chance, whether it's reintroduced or whether it's existing animals, plus the horrendous welfare implications for the cats themselves, or whether we look at new measures, which I understand would have to be looked at carefully, but we look at new measures which would seem to be a basic necessity for good cat care, good cat health, which is neutering and ID chipping. Veterinary professionals support neutering and ID chipping as basic essentials of good cat health care. 
so do all the cat and pet welfare organisations support it and do it with their own cats. Um, so to sum up, I, I think what's brought me here is that I think Scotland's in a unique position. We have the wild cat to think about and a big responsibility. There's less of them than there are tigers. And yet poorer countries than ours are doing a lot more conservation-wise to help tigers. We need to be helping the Scottish Wildcat Action Project with its legacy, which is it can do the, the start. They, ca they can um, backbreed the wildcats we have left, and, and, but we have to do the rest. We have to create a habitat that's safe for them to thrive in in the future. And to my view, and most other people who sign my petition, uh, they agree that we have a responsibility to keep our domestic cats safe as well and not let this carnage and waste of lives happen. So um, I wouldn't like to see Scotland on the wrong side of history and so I brought this petition to you to hopefully share the thinking and have you ask me questions now. <laughs> very you. much uh, for that and I'll ask Angus to open up. Okay, thank you. Good, good morning, Ellie. Um, in your uh, submission, you've written to the Scottish Government, um, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, the Cross Party Group on Animal Welfare, and your regional MSPs, yes. uh, as well as discussing with your constituency MSP, Graham Day. Um, can I ask what feedback you received from uh, all these approaches? Yes, I've had, I think, three times I've written now to the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment and received responses back from the Animal Welfare section, not from the Conservation section of government, which I did wonder about, but they came from Animal Welfare. Um, support from my own MSP in the sense that um, I've had um, regional and my own constituency MSP write to the Cabinet Secretary for me and got very much a standard response back, which is the government's position is that cats really aren't an issue and go about their own business and look after themselves and don't cause humans any difficulties. I would beg to differ that the evidence suggests that they cause some nuisance to some people and distress to others uh, who care about animals and of course have a conservation impact that's of international uh, importance. Um, I would say that probably the letters I've had back have perhaps shown that I would like to see an update in the government's information and awareness about the issues I'm raising, and perhaps that would lead to some different thinking. Um, Cross-party group and animal welfare, I met with a convener um, some months ago and received positive, uh, good listening, um, and uh, all the MSPs who've taken the trouble to write back to me, I've written to all of them now, all who have written back have been recognising the importance of the, the twin issues that I've raised, the animal welfare and the conservation side. Um, and I think their main concerns have been about the compulsory, apparently compulsory nature of what the steps that would need to be taken, if that's what you asked. I hope I've answered. No, that's, that's fine, thanks. Yeah, I mean, you know, looking at the notes that we have, um, or the briefing that we have, I mean, the figures are quite staggering. There's 400,000 feral cats and 286,000 new kittens a year. So you can see why there's the overspill that you were talking about uh, in your, your opening uh, remarks. Um, but that's fine. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Ellie. Um, I have to say, uh, I was a bit shocked. I didn't know all this about cats, so so it made for very interesting reading. Um, but you state that within the Code of Practice and the SNH guidance notes on, on native range, ownership and degree of control are ill-defined and open to interpretation. Um, and I note your comment that own domestic cats that roam freely are considered to be under the human control, um, something my husband might disagree with, I have to say, um, and, but that is if they are expected to return to the owners. Can you expand on this point? And would you have an example of how you consider the definitions could be better defined? Yes. Uh, I, I was When I did the research earlier this year, I was quite stunned to, to, to find that definition too. Um, because cats, dogs, farmed animals are all classified as non-native species, that general term to be under human control is applied to all those species. So for farm stock, <coughs> horses, other sorts of kept animals, they can be fenced in, so that would be a simple way of keeping them under human control. Under the legislation, 
the code of practice, say you kept a horse and a tree fell down and broke the fencing and the horse escaped, you could possibly be open to, it would be a criminal prosecution, you would be open to criminal prosecution for not maintaining your fencing or not checking it. Or you'd have, you, the responsibility would be on you because it's a strict liability offence to demonstrate that you checked the fence yesterday and it was perfectly all right, but it was a storm overnight. Um, with dogs, there's human control to do with leads, training and what have you. With cats, and, the, and what your husband has said to you is what everyone who's read my petition has said to me. And frontline, um, really, you know, war-weary cat rescue volunteers all say to me is that if you know cat behaviour, then cats are not under human control in the way that dogs are. You can't just call and they come back. Some cats are, but, but very few. So cat behaviour varies along a continuum. Um, there are issues of welfare whereby you can't contain cats legally in the way you could a horse. You can't fence it in, you can't shut it in. That would be a welfare issue. Totally right. The middle of the road solution to me and to the veterinary professionals to uh, conservationists, to cat owners, or to at least to 90% of them, S the middle road answer to that that seems to be, if your cat is neutered, then it's free of the hormonally driven behaviour, um, which is what drives wandering, roaming, territorial fighting, transmission of disease, and obviously for female cats, producing two to three litters a year of five kittens each, which is a ticket to early death um, and to not coming back because cats move out and colonise new areas when they produce young. Um, so I've suggested that in a simple change of wording in the code of practice defining under human control, redefining it from expected to return which is subjective anyway, to something objective and pragmatic and that you can observe or touch or feel or measure, which is sensible, um, would be it's neutered. And if a cat's neutered, then that satisfies the vast majority of cat lovers, the, everybody who's a vet professional, everybody who's a member of the public who doesn't like cats, because if you don't like cats, you don't want there to be 60 living next door to you. So it seems to me to be a middle of the road um, requ requirement um, to have a cat neutered and therefore it's regarded as under human control. And how would you include in that for obviously breeders, showers, all that, that kind? So would they have to be specially licensed under that arrangement? I think that, <clears throat> sorry, the f yeah, the first step I would think about, obviously I've, I've not worked in those areas of licensing, but um, there would be no nothing to stop a person being a breeder of cats. Um, so there's no constraint, there's no compulsion to not breed. You could be a breeder of cats, but you would apply for a licence that would exempt you from the, the non-native species legislation. So your freedoms aren't being curtailed. The, the issue would then be whoever sets the conditions of the licence. Then that happens every day with licences that are issued for conservation purposes, interference with protected wild species. Licences are issued for interference with those, but the conditions have to be followed by the developers. And I, I would envisage it being the same for breeders. There would be conditions that if you're licensed to breed cats, as happens in France, as I understand it, one condition to be a breeder is that you must have undergone a, a, a set piece of training that probably a local college would provide or something of that sort, and there would be um, a, a scope for... Um, younger people who want to work with animals to come and work with you at your breeding establishment and learn the tools of the trade and learn about cat welfare and the importance of vaccination. Because I haven't mentioned vaccination yet, but hugely important from a, an epidemiological point of view. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you say that um, uh, you believe a new approach is required because, as you've stated, there's ten percent of cat owners who don't uh, uh, have the cats neutered despite uh, a, a appeal such as the snip and chip uh, appeal. I, I wonder if you had any views on other ways in which the benefits of neutering can be promoted specifically through perhaps uh, veterinarians and, and sort of animal welfare charities. Thank you for the question. Yes, it, it's one that it's 
that reasoning that you've outlined, um, relying on the voluntary approach, I suppose it sums up as, is what I've relied on until recently and all my colleagues in frontline animal rescue, cat rescue, rely on is that we would nudge towards good advice, good veterinary intervention, um, being taken on board by everyone who feels they're a responsible cat owner. The trouble with it and is that it seems to have gone as far as it can go. From, from the studies, the, um, the cat population group, which is a UK-wide group, uh, works PDSA, People's Dispensary for Sick Animals, as a member of that, as are eight other pet organisations. They produce a report each year, which is a, a snapshot of um, cat ownership. And they've been reporting a nudging up of neutered rate amongst cat owners up until the last two or three years and it's now stalled um, and then it was up to UK wide they were saying last year 2016 we've reached 93% neutered rate it's back down to 90% this year now a lot of that is a facsimile of the approach it's a YouGov opinion poll those of you who are scientifically minded know that opinion polls measure public opinion they don't go out and count cats <laughs> so it's a huge difference um, the people who sit at home and say, yes, I'll put my name on a panel and I'll be happy to be consulted by YouGov and answer the questions are the people who are connected up to the, to, to the world. The people I meet are not connected to that same world. So it's probably a huge underestimate of, of unneutered cats. So it's worrying to think the voluntary approach has gone as far as it can go. I think the people I meet and the, the frontline cat rescue workers I meet confirm it, the people who don't have their cats neutered are people who perhaps live in very socially marginalised positions themselves, who perhaps live without a lot of social resources, such as contact with email, such as uh, networks where people can, friends and family can encourage them to have their cats neutered. Um, they're the same people who perhaps have lots of other social problems and it's not to blame those people, but if we if we don't bring those people on board, what the vets are telling us is that we we risk a huge explosion, not my word, an explosion of the cat population. That brings with it um, potential for unvaccinated cats, and most are unvaccinated, even the neutered ones. Um, feline diseases run rife when overpopulation is the case. So we're actually putting the neutered pet cats at risk, yours and mine at home are at risk because of the actions of the few who, who don't yet neuter. I thought hard about this and I thought about, for example, the people who used to um, still smoke in public places um, until we reached the point of saying, but that even, even that affects the health of us all because we're all breathing the smoke. And that's a similar argument <clears throat> to my mind of, people who are not neutering their cats, it's not just their cats that are suffering, and they are suffering. Um, if you want to ask me later about any of the conditions, I'll happily tell you. Um, but they are suffering. But the risk is increasing to the rest of the cats, the 90% of people's own cats, through disease transmission, and through still territorial fights, and cats that are wandering and ranging, um, and, and suffering. Very just just from my own information, do you, do you think it's that there's a, that there's a, a possibility or, or an idea of, of maybe compulsory registering of pet pet not just pet cats but pet animals? If the, if the way I would think about that, tell me if I'm wrong. The way I'd think about that would be um, like has happened with dog microchipping just recently. Is um, all dogs are microchipped and therefore have to be microchipped and therefore by definition the microchips registered on a managed database so if something similar happened for cats or if the same system happened for cats um, then the there would be a managed database and what also happens with dogs is that if your dog produces offspring so if a cat produces offspring um, you would have to register and you would be responsible for the microchipping and we could say neutering of the offspring as well as your own cat. If you're keeping a cat that's 
producing offspring and you're not registered as a breeder, you would presumably be very quickly encouraged to register as a breeder and therefore you would be responsible for the neutering and uh, microchipping of the offspring. That's the case for other pets. I don't know about horses, but I do know there are passport systems. Sorry, I do know about horses, but not in such detail. And there are passport systems for horses that track exactly what their health conditions are. But cats are the species where neutering and vaccinating are the basic necessities of the, po the population health, not just the individual cat health. That's the issue. Thank you, Convener. And I uh, should declare an interest as a member of a cross-party group on animal welfare. Um, good morning. Um, in just following on, really, from my colleague, uh, Brian Whittle, in response to a written parliamentary question on neutering, microchipping and, and registration of cats, the Cabinet Secretary said, we do not consider these actions should be compulsory for cats. Can I have your response on that? I, I would suggest that a lot of that is to do with quite genuinely people in government not having had time, as we were all shocked, well I was shocked at these statistics you've said you were, not having had time to process that. Um, I've written a lot of stuff down, people don't always have time to read things in such depth. I think if someone did read it in depth they would, they would see. You, you have figures from me, you obviously have because you've asked the quest, questions about from whether it's you know, under half a million or nearly a million unneutered cats in Scotland, we're, we're, you know, we're doubling the population every, more than doubling the population every four years, which is going to take us to over two million cats in four years' time. But that's been happening all this time. The number of homes isn't going up, it's going down, if anything. So there are, there are new issues like that to take on board. I'd given you those figures, but I hadn't done the graph. That's just the graph of the figures I gave you, which I'll leave with you if, if you care to accept it, which shows, well, the orange you can't probably see, but the, the orange is the, the additional cats each year, year on year, on top of um, the cats that are in the population. The blue is just the existing population of cats. That's a conservative estimate. That doesn't take into account the cat's offspring then start having kittens the following year. So it's exponential if you include that. So if your cat has five kittens and two or three of them are female and they produce five kittens each twice a year. But I haven't even counted that. The other thing to bear in mind is that a fair proportion, maybe over half of the 90% who say they neuter their cats, have already let them have litters before they neuter them. So I haven't counted those kittens either. Um, so the, the graph is exponential there, but it's, it's even more so. So I would say if, if government had time to take on board these facts and statistics, I would say the other <coughs> thing I would like them to have time to consider is to update their model of cat behaviour because, and I don't know whether this is animal welfare section or conservation and wildlife section, but the model of animal behaviour for cats needs to have incorporated in it the understanding that they're a roaming, a widely roaming species, probably as widely roaming as the wild cat if they're not neutered. And so they they do not they, they're not under human control if they're unneutered. They are, cannot be expected to come back. And the fact that the wild cat uh, maybe in the north of Scotland, if there's any left, maybe in the north of Scotland now, but the numbers of domestic cats that become feral and are there, they can be neutered and that can be stabilised. But domestic cats are roaming, moving in cars, being taken in by people into those areas. They'll recolonise just in the way I experienced in the last 20 years. So neutering... Um, for cats, why would we why would we apply it to some cats if we think it's so important to their welfare and not apply it to all cats, owned cats? It is important to their welfare. Why would we not ask for it to be true for all cats? And therefore, we can also protect the Scottish wild cat. Okay, can, I, can I just ask um, briefly? Um, clarification briefly on a, on a second point. Um, in the second part of your submission, uh, you include a proposal from the Scottish Wildcat Action, Anna Meredith, I think it was, 
In answer to another parliamentary question, the Cabinet Secretary suggested that this had not been submitted to the Scottish Government, thus no response was, was given. Um, can I ask for your understanding of whether or how this was presented to the Scottish Government? Do you know anything in the background of that? Yes. Um, I actually, I think, made a typing error when I was putting in my evidence. It was That's the paper there. Um, Professor Anna Meredith is a Professor of Zoological and Conservation Medicine at Edinburgh University, and she was invited to convene the cat control population, the cat population control group for the Scottish Wildcat Action, and was invited by them to put together a, a paper. So it's fully referenced and totally up to date. That was 2016 that um, that was taken to the Scottish Government, but, but I believe it wasn't animal welfare, it would be conservation and wildlife. Um, and it, it, but it's there, it's, it's with the Scottish Government, so I can't explain that, unless it's as simple as there are different sections of government, obviously, and the one may not know what the, the other has, but it's, it is probably a cent the central, because it contains the research authenticated and referenced that I've presented to you in the best way I could. Um, right, Clear start up, thank you. Okay, thanks, um, convener. Uh, you've, you've, you've listed five things in the petition that you'd like to see happen through any review of the Code of Practice, um, which I won't uh, detail because they're, they're already in the petition. Um, how would you see these five things administered and enforced, and have you considered the cost of enforcement? So you're referring to, um, I've asked for... New Sorry, I'm perhaps not five, understanding. Five items through the Code of Practice, the Native Range Guidance associated with the 2011 Act. Would you like me to list them? Please, yes. OK. Uh, a neutered, uh, number one, a neutered cat to be defined as under human control and exempt from NNS legislation. Are you with me now? Thank you. I've got it now. Okay. Yes, bottom of second page on my petition. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, so you'd like me to... Well, just explain um, how you'd like to see uh, the five asks happen um, through any the review actual, of the code of practice. And the actual practicalities of how it Yeah, could, and also could, whether you've considered the cost of enforcement. Yes, right. Yeah, so number one, I think we've possibly covered in that um, a simple redefinition within the code of practice um, as uh, under human control from expected to return to neutered and preferably neutered and ID chipped. Um, that wouldn't require a change in law. That would require an amendment to the code of practice. Um, so we're not, we couldn't be accused of criminalising people. We're just redefining the code of practice. Um, secondly, that all owned cats be neutered, microchipped and registered and the cost to be borne by the owner. The one with cost implications, obviously, although the majority of people um, pay for, you know, bear their own cost, the majority of owners, um, bear the responsibility for their own cost. Cat welfare organisations and generic pet welfare organisations all tell me in recent two to three years that neutering is such an important priority for them, they actually will provide free neutering for people. It's available if it's needed. You don't have to go through a demeaning uh, um, income assessment test. You're not asked awkward questions. If you need it, you will get your cat neutered. You can make a £5 donation to some of the schemes. If you want, you don't have to. So a lot, most of this is not about cost. There may be an issue of if there's a, an immediate surge in the demand on veterinary professionals to provide the neutering, that would need to be thought about. And there would be a surge on the financial resources of the charities providing this. But all the charities I know require neutering and don't sign over cats until they're neutered or kittens until they're neutered anyway. But yet yeah, you can you can access free neutering. I can't imagine people would be coming forward in a huge flood in one go if it was staged over the next one or two years. I did do some costings at one stage. I haven't brought them with me. There would be, if everybody came at once, a cost implication. Um, the licensed uh, exemption scheme, in the case of microchipping dogs, I know that breeders, <coughs> breeders are now classed as breeders if their dog has offspring and they register with the kennel club. It would be 
really helpful if some thought could be given uh, as to what what body that would be that would involve for cats. But I don't think it should be local authorities, as I think some of the thinking in England has has gone along the lines of um, they don't have the resources and. Certainly the way the discussion about cat population control in England has gone is seems to be asking local authorities to to suss out the um, repeat sellers of kittens and ensure that they become registered as breeders. Well, I don't think they're going to be terribly comfortable at being asked to take on that role, even if they have the resources, because they're not really... That's almost been asked to take on a, a policing of the system role. I don't think this should be seen as policing bad behaviour. Here's a psychologist speaking. It should be seen as we're all trying to get everybody on the side of good behaviour. And it's really important in Scotland because we have got the wild cat to think about and we care about our cats. Full stop. Scotland has a wild cat. Um, are you aware of any other countries in Northern Europe that have a similar problem? And have any countries in Northern Europe already implemented what you're asking for? In terms of mandatory neutering, yeah, um, I know that when you say Northern Europe, certainly in some of the states in America it's been introduced, and in Australia it's been introduced, and there's restrictions on keeping pets all together in Australia in some areas because of the decimation and complete loss of native wildlife. Northern Europe varies, as I understand it. There are various policies in different countries, but I understand there are parts of... Uh, I can't name you the country... But there are there certainly is uh, there are examples in Europe where, for example, no culling of feral and homeless cats has been introduced, and trap neuter return has been adopted as a policy. In order, Italy, for example, um, has got a no cull policy and a very pro trap neuter return policy. And there's a study somewhere in one of these papers that shows it does work if you work at it positively. But it only works if you turn off the tap at the other end. And the tap is um, stopping people producing more kittens. I couldn't tell you whether the law has requires people to be registered as breeders and prevents people keeping unneutered cats otherwise in Italy. But they have found it works. And that's the humane approach to cat control. Um, thanks very much for that. I think that's been, again... Um, very useful and very interesting. I wonder if members have um, a view on the action we might want to take on the petition. Brian? I think it would be, would be useful to uh, seek the views of, uh, for example, um, the RSPCA and other organisations uh, like that, just to get their perspective uh, yeah. on this problem. So animal welfare organisations, I think there's um, cats protection amongst others. We can maybe just get the cats to clear what the the, the ones would be. I'm quite interested in the conservation side, so maybe yeah. we should look into the conservation bodies as well. Mm -hmm. Any others? Vet, veterinary bodies as well. Sorry? Vets as yep. well. Okay. Yeah. I think we should uh, write to the Scottish Government again and, and just ask, um, particularly around this confusion about whether they've actually read the report, so we might want to, to write to a, a number of the policy areas yeah. and just see well, what the commentary is. I think if we write to the Minister and then yeah. it becomes an obligation to them to yeah. draw the different yeah. aspects together rather yeah. than to see it's what seems to be mm. suggested compartmentalised mm. the way it's been. Angus? Yeah. Um, I hate to be pedantic, convener, but, um, and I don't like to contradict my colleague Brian Whittle, but can we make it the SSPCA rather than the yes. RSPCA? <laughs> well, A, you do like to contradict <laughs> him, <laughs> and B, you're quite right in this regard. <laughs> Is very important. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, yeah. There were, um, I think I've seen it in your briefing notice that some of these suggestions were there. Um, there was, there's been some good publicity supporting the 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 proposal. Um, the Sunday Herald's environment correspondent did a special report some time back, and he did some good investigative journalism. Spoke to the SSPCA. Uh, why not speak to the RSPCA as well? Because mm -hmm. they're on the cat population control group, and that's and they've they've done a lot of work at the UK level, and they're the ones who produced in 2014 the first report that caught my attention that said we have a catastrophe looming because they started looking at cat population increase and available homes levelling off. 
which is a recipe for disaster, but nobody's looked at the continuing trends since. So it's a group called the Cat Population Control Group and People's Dispensary for Sick Animals, RSPCA, um, various organisations are in that. You might okay, contact I think PSA. if there are further suggestions, then we'll take them on board. But the key thing is we're trying to draw together across the expertise in both um, animal welfare and in conservation and, and bodies we've identified, but emphasising to the minister that it isn't just one thing or the other, it's actually the way that the connection between the two. I Michelle. think it would be good to write to the PDSA because obviously yeah. from a charitable point of view they pick up and, and that question again about a surge, um, you know, the PDSA would probably have a view on how, how that would be coped with. Okay. So I think that would be good. Because they're the ones who commission the YouGov annual yeah. report, so they've got okay. the data at their fingertips. Okay, we can, we can ensure the CLATs get a wide range of, of, mm -hmm. of views and the, the information that you were displaying there um, mm -hmm. during one of the answers. We can obviously make sure that's circulated and made available as well. So with that, can I thank you very much again for your attendance? I think that was very useful. And can I suspend the meeting briefly to allow the witness to leave the table before we continue? Thank you. Back to order again, um, and we're going on to agenda item three, a new petition where we're not taking evidence. The petition is petition 1672 by Hugh Patterson, which is calling on the Scottish Government, Scottish Parliament, pardon, to urge the Scottish Government to consider remedial action in terms of the law relating to prescription and limitation. Members have a copy of the petition and a spice briefing. The petition background information outlines that the petition relates to prescription and principally negative prescription, which extinguishes legal rights after the passage of time. The petition expresses concern over how the current law of negative prescription applies to some claims for damages where the purchase of a property has gone wrong and the purchaser has not received good legal title to all or part of it. The relevant legislation on prescription is the Prescription and Limitation Scotland Act 1973. Aspects of the law of negative prescription under this Act have recently been reviewed by the Scottish Law Commission, and a report was published recommending various reforms to Scottish ministers in July of this year. The Scottish Government is taking forward these recommendations through a, 
a commitment to a bill and prescription as set out in this year's programme to government. Members may wish to note that the petitioner responded to the Scottish Law Commission's discussion paper, which informed the recommendations in the final report. While the Commission considered the issue raised by the petitioner, a decision was made not to recommend changing the law in this area. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Michelle? I mean, it is a very interesting one because obviously uh, the legal terminology is quite complicated and there are very good reasons why these things are in place. So I have some, some empathy for the petitioner, but I also have some empathy for the, the position of, of the Legal Commission. What I do think, or what occurred to me when I was going through the papers, is there might be a, a, a simple solution to this that doesn't require a change to the law. But in terms of the changes that are occurring with land registration, one of the problems is that when you buy a property and, and it is registered, that you don't receive notification of that registration. So as an owner, and particularly where you're mortgaged or whatever, the title deed goes to, to the mortgage holder. And perhaps the simple solution would be that at the time of registration, that the purchaser receives a letter of notification specifying what has gone into the the land registry, and therefore you know immediately at that time whether or not your title has been adequately registered. And at that time, you would then challenge it, rather than waiting till 25, 30 years down the line when you come to sell the property and discover that the registration wasn't complete. So I wonder whether we could ask the government whether they could look at that concept, because that would then not require any change to negative prescription, but it would protect the registration and the possible failure of registration. The Scottish Government also ha has highlighted that instead of a court claim for damages, a complaint could be made against a solicitor. So, But solicitors may not even be there at that point. And actually, the the requirement... I mean, I've, I've been dealing recently with a few problems with transfer of, of properties and inspection titles, etc. And it is extremely difficult to take an action against a solicitor especially 25 years down the line. Mm -hmm. So I think we need a much simpler solution. And it's very costly as well, taking on a solicitor. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and perhaps very unfair when you have, in good faith, have purchased a property um, and done all the right things, paid the solicitor to do the job, to find yourself 25 years down the line trying to fight something that had happened. OK. Brian? Yeah. Oh, an, an interesting one, as, mm -hmm. as Michelle said. I think... Um, I do, I do, I do agree with uh, Michelle in terms of looking for a solution that doesn't require a uh, massive change to the law. Um, I think that uh, I, I do think we should be writing to the Scottish government. I also quite like to to understand from maybe the, the ombudsman what their view of that is, because there is obviously an issue with like, with with taking uh, court action. You know, I wonder 20, if 30 years down the line. Yeah, I, I wonder if it, the Scottish government would be the first place sensible place to go first because obviously the Law Commission, it's their job to look at these things and to, to give advice mm. and the Scottish Government has decided to take particular advice and I don't think to, to act in a way suggesting the position to get a sense of that first. Yeah, okay. Um, what the thinking behind is because presumably they've spent some time in this and they've tried to get the, the balance of these issues right and it'd be useful to uh, maybe to get a sense from the Scottish Government why in the end that's the view they've taken. Because I, I think there are very good reasons for negative prescription. Um, you, you can't have an open-ended situation where people can always go back and, and, and revisit things. You have to have an end point. Um, and 20 years is a, is a pretty long end point by anybody's standards. So, so this is about ensuring that, that obvious things don't go missing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I say I have empathy on both sides and, and I can understand and I think there is a need for ne negative prescription to have a closed date. I think it is really important. Can mm. we agree then that we would write the Scottish Government and maybe mm. we can highlight in, in that the suggestion that had been made by Michelle Ballantyne to get a sense of mm. what was the thinking around the final conclusions and then we can revisit it. But, but it's clearly something, it's not an issue come across every day. At one level it's technical, but for the people who have been, been caught up in it, it's far beyond technical. So I think it's an interesting one for us. Um, to ask the Scottish Government its views on. OK, is that agreed? Mm -hmm. OK, in that case, if we can move on. Um, 
The fourth and final item today is consideration of five continued petitions. The first petition for consideration under this item is petition 1458 on register of interest for members of Scotland's judiciary. We last considered the petition in June when we took evidence from Lord Carloway, the Lord President. We agreed to reflect on that evidence and we have a briefing note that summarises the issues that came up in that evidence session. We also have two submissions from the petitioner which convey his response to the evidence and also provide information about some additional developments in relation to the recusal of judges. As members are aware, this petition has been under consideration for five years and I think we do have a good understanding of the arguments that have been put forward both for and against the introduction of a register of interest for judges and there has been some movement, I think, as well. I wonder if members have any comments on action that we should now be taking. Angus? Yeah, uh, thanks, convener. Um, as you rightly point out, this petition's been ongoing now for five years uh, to this date, uh, exactly. Uh, and I think it's worth noting that uh, it was originally based on the consideration of a register of pecuniary interests uh, of judges built in New Zealand, uh, which was subsequently dropped after we started taking evidence uh, on Peter Cherby's petition. Um, now, it's fair to say we've taken extensive evidence in this petition over the past five years, not least from the former Lord President, Lord Gill, uh, the current Lord President, Lord Carloway, as well as judicial complaints reviewers, Moy Ali and Gillian Thompson, and we appreciate the time, clearly, that they've taken uh, with this committee. Um, I think it's fair to say, convener, that this petition has already secured a result uh, to the extent that there's now more transparency with the publication of judicial recusals, which didn't happen uh, before. Uh, and it's worth pointing out that it still doesn't happen in England, Wales or Northern Ireland. So Mr Cherby should be uh, proud that his petition has achieved that. Um, However, I note that the petitioner suggested we take evidence from Baroness Hale, um, President of the UK Supreme Court, as well as the new judi Judicial uh, Complaints Reviewer. Now, with, with regard to taking evidence from Baroness Hale, I, I feel we could be stretching the bounds of the petition, which urged the Scottish Government to create a register of judiciary interests in Scotland. And I'm not sure if we have the remit to extend to the UK Supreme Court. Um, so Mr Cherby may well be advised to to, uh, to take that uh, aspect to the UK petitions, UK Parliament's Petitions Committee, um, which, which may have more uh, uh, remit there. I think we, I'm sensing we have an agreement to the approach that's been outlined by um, Angus there then that we would um, not be taking further evidence, but we maybe try to draw together our conclusions and then mm -hmm. we can perhaps write to Scottish Government and get a response from them, but also recognising there has been has um, progress. Been can we agree that, that, that we... the letter is drafted and the, 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 comment, the, the conclusions it draws, we can, we can agree that in private when it comes to that item and then we can it will also be in the public domain once it's, it's been considered? That's agreed. That's agreed yeah. I, would, I would agree, Can I just say, um, I, I think we do have to move this forward. It's been ongoing for five years, and um, you know, I could sense from Mr. Cherby's recent submission that there was a slight a degree of frustration there, uh, which I would share. Mm -hmm. And the letter that we were writing would also go to the Lord President. Yeah. We can, but we understand that. But I think that it should also be recognition that there has been um, some progress. So, if that's agreed. Um, those, those decisions are, are agreed. We can move on then to the next petition, which the next continued petition is Petition 1651 by Marion Brown on prescribed drug dependence and withdrawal. We last considered this petition on 29th of June 2017 and agreed to write to the Scottish Government, the British Medical Association, the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Prescribed Drug Dependence, the Scottish Association for Mental Health and the Samaritans. Responses have now been received as well as written submissions from the petitioner and the information is included within our meetings papers. The Scottish Government's written submission highlighted that the significant rise in the number of people being prescribed antidepressants can be attributed to a reduction in stigma attached to mental health, better diagnosis and treatment of depression, and reflects the sustained rise in demand for mental health services across Scotland. 
The petitioner re-emphasised her concerns that people are taking antidepressants over a longer period of time because they have not been supported to come off them safely. The petitioner also highlighted that while sign guidelines recommend initial alternatives to antidepressants, in all but the most severe case of depression, these alternatives are often not available and that waiting times for non-pharmacological treatment quote, make a mockery of the application of the sign guidance. Members will recall from previous consideration of this petition that the British Medical Association published an analysis report focused on prescription drugs with an established uh, dependence potential and withdrawal effects. One of the recommendations in the report is for the UK government to work with the devolved nations to introduce a national 24-hour helpline for prescribed drug dependence. The Scottish government has indicated that it does not have the resources available to fund such a helpline. The committee may also wish to note that the Welsh Assembly is currently considering a similar petition and that a number of recent uh, news articles have highlighted the issues raised in the petition. The petitioner has also brought um, to our attention the recent publication by the NHS Information Service Division of Statistics for deaths by suicide in the period from 2009 to 2015. The report notes that of the, of the 5,119 individuals who died from suicide in this period, over half, 59%, had at least one mental health drug prescription dispensed within 12 months of death, and over four of, out of five of these individuals was prescribed an antidepressant drug, either alone or in combination with other medication. The report also notes that the most common form of recorded contact with medical services was a mental health prescription. I wonder if members have any comments. I think it's interesting we it perhaps connects into our yeah, earlier discussion because I was concerned when I read this um, that the Scottish Government's submission implied that that the fact there was more prescription suggested that was something that, that um, there's more awareness when in fact it may be that people are more likely to be prescribed inappropriately. We don't know what the truth of that is, of course, but I thought that was... I don't think correlation is not necessarily the same as a, um, a causal link. I think, I think you know those kind of conclusions at best are anecdotal. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know I think within all of that there, there is good work being done. I think, but, but also within that, I think there's there's more things to be explored. Um, I, wonder, I wonder with given with the previous uh, petition we were discussing about bringing the mental health minister and whether what we could at the same time maybe. Um, I ask about this particular petition as well. Yeah, I think, I think it would be good to have her here and to cover both, but I don't think we should cover them together. I think we should take them separately because one relates very much to children and young people and how how um, we work with children and young people and the services of children and young people, but whether and whether she could cope with one after the other, um, I don't know, but uh, it would be logical to do that. Mm -hmm scheduled one after the other mm. with plenty of time for her to be able to address these questions. Yeah. I do think there's a connection, or it feels to me as if there's a connection, um, that if people are, because of whatever circumstance, they end up um, being prescribed uh, prescription drugs, and then, the, but there's not a means by which they then come off them or supported in them. And these statistics that have been highlighted, petitioner, I don't understand. I wouldn't pretend to be able to interpret them properly, but it would be useful to have that that conversation. Yeah. And I think it it, it obviously is very heavily linked because, the, as as we were hearing earlier, the majority of problems start within adolescence, and some of these will have been a continuation of mm -hmm. a problem that wasn't solved in the first place. So I think we should. Uh, and the minister would be able to bring But it maybe allow the, the whole meeting for... But the relevant yeah. officials along with her that would be ensuring yeah. it would have that... Yeah. 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 A bit of um, yeah. background <laughs> stats. Mm -hmm. I think it's a huge, you know, hugely important issue. So I think, you know, we, at this stage it would be good to have the minister um, and we can ask the relevant questions. Mm -hmm. Is that great? And I think the information great. provided by the petitioner, again, does give us a lot of food for thought about actually why the petition matters so much to, to her and to try and tease out you know, the, the issue about appropriate. Clearly, as I think as they were said earlier, it's very important to underline that for some people it is necessary um, to, have to be prescribed drugs and there ought not to be stigma around them, but there's a question of whether the, um, the people have been supported to come back off them or whether they're inappropriately prescribed in the first place. Okay, um, can 
Thank you very much for that. And again, thank the petitioner for their interest. If we can move on to the next petition, which is petition 1654 by Ian Munn on forestry regulation. At last consideration of this petition on the 22nd of June 2017, we agreed to write the Scottish Government, CONFOR, the Forestry Commission Scotland, the Forestry Contractors <coughs> Association, the Scottish Timber Trade Association, the Woodland Trust, the Royal Scottish Forestry Society and relevant local authorities. Responses have now been received, as well as a written submission from the petitioner, and this information is included within our meeting papers. The committee asked the Scottish Government what progress had been made on the Road by Sea Timber Transport Initiative and what the benefits and limitations are of such initiatives. The Scottish Government's response highlighted that it provides a subsidy for Timberlink, which moves 80 to 100,000 tonnes of timber by sea from Argyll to Ayrshire, removing up to 1 million lorry miles per annum from the road network. The Scottish Government's response recognised, however, that in the majority of cases where timber is shipped to market, at least some part of the rural road network will need to be used. The committee also asked the Scottish Government whether it intended to introduce measures on consultation in the forestry sector in either primary or secondary legislation with the introduction of the Forestry and Land Management Scotland <coughs> Bill. The Government's written submission confirmed that it had no plans to do so reporting the strong culture of collaborative working that currently exists between local authorities and the forestry sector on a non-statutory basis, as well as the high level of consultation and guidance within the sector. This was also reflected in the majority of written submissions received. The petitioner, however, re-emphasised the importance of including timber transport in the bill, as the industry has been shown as either not being able to or willing to self-regulate. And I think I should thank all those we've got very substantial responses from local authorities and others, um, which have really um, helped our, our thinking in this regard. I wonder if people have any comments on the petition, Angus? Yeah, uh, thanks, um, convener. Um, can I say I understand the petitioner's frustration on, on the issue? Um, however, judging by the responses we've received from stakeholders, albeit some with a vested interest uh, in the industry, it would seem that uh, thanks to schemes like the Scottish Strategic Timber Transport Scheme, <laughs> um, significant progress has been made on, on the issue. And, and given that the majority of respondents uh, do not support or recognise the need for uh, statutory measures to be implemented, I think uh, um, there's a strong argument to close the petition under Rule 15.7. Okay, do we have other views? Yes, I'd, yeah. I'd, I would support Angus's view that... Um, you know, as we've received a fantastic response, and um, I think from that you can only deduce that there is a strong argument to, to close. Um, and also, that you know, it's clear that local authorities have power when it comes to, to forestry routes, etc., to sort things out in their own area, put in traffic restrictions, and um, and 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 that's been working. And I, I don't, so I don't think there's any need for statutory legislation. I've, I've huge empathy with the petitioner um, living in a rural area where we get a lot of timber transport uh, movement. Um, there is no doubt that, that his frustrations are, are real um, and are shared by much of the population. Um, but the, the issue here is, is that you can't actually bring legislation that will solve most of these problems. And agreement has to be place by place. It isn't a one-size-fits-all. It has to be individual solutions for individual areas. Um, and a lot of that is achieved through relationships and through negotiation and through agreement. Um, and I think it, that is the only way to do it. We, we have to encourage that. Um, and I do think the good response we had is indicative of the work that's going on underneath to actually do that. Um, I think where the petitioner requires to damage to private property, um, I suppose the reminder would be that if there is damage to private property, he has the same rights to claim um, against that uh, as usually would for any damage that occurs to private property. I know that can be difficult sometimes, um, but m maybe that is you know, what, what he needs to do or, or what people need to do. Um, I understand that a lot of those damages are verge um, ripping which is, is difficult, um, and it is due to the nature of many of our roads, which are quite narrow. Um, and I think that's just going to be an ongoing problem. Um, but it is just the reality of, of the world we live in at the moment, sadly. Um, but no, I think it's something we just will all keep working at 
and I wholeheartedly support the fact that there's nowhere to go with this at this time other than to close it. I mean, especially since the, the Scottish Government have indicated that they have no, uh, no, um, they're not, they're not going to deal, do anything with this, no plans to do anything with this. So it, would, it seems to me that there's nowhere left to go. I was struck by two things that you know there was a certain scepticism in the path of the petitioner about whether the, the responses had been coordinated, but nevertheless, whether they have been or not, there is a. Um, it's a very strong feeling that the petition shouldn't be taken forward, but also that idea of responsibility, you know, whether it should be a levy or something. But I suppose, the, um, in, I think accepting the view that we should close the petition, it doesn't close down the possibility for individual members of the parliament to put down amendments to the transport bill to test these things further, see whether there is a, a legislative route. So I think that's another um, possibility for the petitioner that we wouldn't be able to take forward, but it, it, it would then be a matter for individual MSPs who have you know, been presented with this case to maybe think about whether that's something they could, could take forward. Um, with that, I sense that there is an, an agreement that we should be closing the petition under Rule 15.7 of standing orders um, on the basis that the majority of written responses received did not support the action called for in the petition, but we would want to thank the petitioner again for highlighting these issues and getting a response, which it does seek to reassure around the responsibilities for the industry to work together with local authorities and others. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay. Convener, before you move on, um, when we write to the petitioner advising uh, him of, of our decision, um, Will there be a, a section included in the letter uh, giving him uh, the, the advice that uh, one option is to uh, attempt to secure amendments in the Forestry Management Bill? Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Um, okay. In reporting what's been said... Stage two at the moment. Stage two? Okay. So, I mean, I mean, I think if we're going to do that... All right, okay. Yeah. Well... It, it may be possible that somebody might take up at stage two, but certainly at stage three. But, but, but it's stage only, two, I believe, is, is with, it was with committee parliament. yesterday, okay. was it not? Right. Yeah, so, 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 so time is really tight. I don't advise. I don't advise yeah. it. But there would be a stage tight. three where it's slightly more difficult to secure that, that response. Mm. But however, um, that would be an option. And the other thing is, I've been reminded that there will be a forestry management strategy coming out of that, the out of the mm. bill, and mm. therefore that might be the place which, again, mm. the petitioner might want to influence yeah. the shape of that. Okay, with that, can we um, thank the petitioner again and move on to the next petition, which is Petition 1656 by Rob McDowell, on threats and assaults on sitting members of Parliament, their staff and families. We last considered this petition on the 22nd of June 2017 and agreed to write to the Scottish Government, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, the Faculty of Advocates, the Law Society of Scotland, Police Scotland and the Scottish Sentencing Council. The responses have now been received and are included within our meeting papers. The majority of responses received highlighted that existing common law and statutory legislation currently in place, which provides for the prosecution of assaults and threatening behaviour committed against anyone, including parliamentarians, their staff and families. Police Scotland's written submission highlighted that the statutory aggravations being called for by the petitioner could complement the existing protective security measures to mitigate risk to parliamentarians. However, the Scottish Government is of the view that there would be significant challenges um, in setting out in statute all the aggravating and mitigating factors for a court to consider in sentencing an offender. And I wonder if members have any comments. I haven't changed my view. I think the law sufficiently covers this already. Um, and it's a question of applying it, not creating new ones. Agreed. Yes, I, I mean, I think, I think there is a law there that's covered. And I think, um, you know, the response that, that we've had um, make it clear that this, this could be used. So I, I think we should close the petition. I don't think there's anywhere else for it to go. Right. Well, I think we've actually heard similar. I mean, other public servants, you know, the police and the fire brigade and the, the ambulance service, and the, the same conclusion has been reached and the, the, the law covers mm -hmm. adequately. I think there's sometimes been, and I remember when the emergency workers legislation went through, there was, it felt there was a need to signal the value we placed in people running towards danger. So, for example, 
firefighters being assaulted as they ran towards a fire or somebody going to a road traffic accident. As a, but then the point was made, well, everybody who works in these services can be at risk. And I suppose on the balance, um, in terms of elected representatives, I would be comforted about the law. I think what we, we're maybe more thinking about is the kinds of issues where we, we make sure that um, particularly our staff are safe and that it's legitimate to you know assess security risks to our staff and any risks we might um, take ourselves. I, mean, I think when I first got elected, I, was, I took, you know, I would do searches on my own in a place where nobody was uh, keeping an eye. That wouldn't that just wouldn't happen that, anymore. Yeah. Mm. So I think there's been a lot of progress in terms of protecting people against incidents, um, and that's you know maybe as important as ensuring that if there's an incident take place, it's taken seriously by the courts. Mm. And, and I think it's important we don't end up with a siege mentality as well. You know, the majority of people are, are decent. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I I think you know we have quite robust laws actually around how people behave. Um, the issue is about how we implement them. Mm. Okay. And I, mean, I think my sense from the petitioner that it's been well motivated recognising yes. mm -hmm. um, that particularly the parliamentary staff can be vulnerable, can be seen as a target. Um, on, on, on all too many occasions, certainly, I think uh, frontline staff answering the phone can be subject to abuse and that's something that's probably quite mm. generally true in the public sector and they ought not to be treated that way. Um, so we, we recognise the motivations of it. But I think we would be agreeing that uh, we would close the petition under Rule 15.7 on the basis of existing legislation and common law are considered to provide sufficient protection for elected members, their staff and family members. Is that agreed? Yep. Agreed. Okay, the final petition or agenda item today uh, is Petition 1658 on compensation for those who suffered a neurological disability following administration of the Pluserix vaccine between 1988 and 1992. The petitioner has requested that we defer our consideration of the petition until a future meeting, as I understand that she would like to attend and observe our discussion of her petition, and I think we may want to give um, further comments before we consider the petition. I've um, agreed that we should uh, consider her uh, request that it be deferred, and I wonder if members are content to defer consideration of the petition to our meeting on the 21st of December. Yes. Is that Indeed. agreed? Yes. Okay. In that case... Um, with that, can I uh, thank people for their attendance and um, close the meeting.